Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hanging on to Hope podcast. I'm Brenda J. And I'm Karen Wonder. And we are HangingOnToHope.org. This podcast is intended as educational and is not psychological or medical advice. Always consult a professional when needed, and we disclaim any liability in connection with the instruction, information, or advice given. This podcast episode discusses the details of domestic violence. Some listeners might find this traumatizing and triggering. Do not listen to this podcast if you feel you may be triggered in any way. If this episode becomes triggering while you are listening, practice self-care and turn off the episode. If you need to talk to someone, you can reach out to your local crisis line or their website, thehotline.org, or their phone number, 1-800-799-SAFE, 1-800-799-7233. All the links are provided in the show notes. To our listeners, we are sorry that we had to pull this recording. So this podcast has been modified from its original version to protect the identity and the name of one of the podcast guests due to legal reasons. Thanks for tuning in to the Hanging On To Hope podcast. This is Karen W. Today's subject matter is going to be difficult to hear, but it is necessary so that we can shine a light on the corruption that is going on in the court system and the incredible harm that it is causing on the children. On today's podcast, we have Jane Doe, who has helped form the Arizona Parents Against Court Corruption Coalition and is herself a victim of domestic violence and court abuse. We also have Rachel on the podcast today to share her story of survival from domestic violence and her case involving her four children, ages 7, 9, 9, and 10, being taken away from her to live with their abuser. We thank you both so much for being here. We just want to say we stand with you in support of your situation. We want to bring attention to your case in the hopes that it'll bring some justice and safety for your children. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much for having us. Well, hi, this is Brenda. It's nice to meet both of you. Nice Nice to to meet you too. So the Arizona Families Against Court Corruption, their mission statement is, we are a group of protective parents united to bring awareness to the corruption within the court systems. We promote healthy, functional relationships between parents and their children in a safe environment free from any type of abuse. We advocate for the voices of our children to be heard, their rights to be protected, and their future to be secure. So did you want to share a little of your background on what led you to be a part of the Arizona Parents Against Court Corruption Coalition? We are against cor- system corruptions, racketing, and child trafficking, which is very rampant right now in family court and in juvenile court. We are against the bogus stereotype of parental alienation and all its derivatives like coaching and brainwashing. All of these have been used widely in the family court and as a tool to remove the children from the protective parents to the abuser. Furthermore, alienation is not recognized by the Americans psychological association and is condemned by the united nations i wanted to clarify we are pro family as long as family everybody is safe and especially our children also i wanted to mention that apac was formed as a result of many of us looking to reform the justice system and giving voices to our children we are now approximately 100 parents in arizona battling against the heartbreaking, mind-blowing core corruption. But I don't want to take too much of your time at this moment, as today is with us, Rachel, an amazing protective mother in the middle of the battle of her life to protect her children. She has suffered immensely and uh, is one of the so, so many cases that we have currently in the coalition where it's just, as I'm saying, heartbreaking and mind-blowing what our core system is doing to our children uh, without no protection or this uh, regard for they, they being a person. So thank you, Rachel, for coming. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. I know this is not an easy thing for you to talk about, Rachel, but could you give us a summary of your relationship with your abuser? Yes. The marriage was relatively short. 
and the children came very fast. Within actually 13 months, we had three children, a, a baby and then a set of twins. And I think that um, it was around the time the twins were born is when the abuse really, really started. And of course, like many other cases, it was very gradual, very subtle. He would make remarks about my older son, disparaging remarks about him, who was not a child that we share. And then gradually, you know, try to alienate my family members and friends, telling me that they were not for my best interest and that they were jealous or that they had um, ill intent. It became physical when I learned that he was secretly abusing my eldest son, who's very quiet and on the spectrum. And when I learned of that and I confronted him, that's when he began to hit me as well. And it wasn't often the hitting. It was uh, in the beginning. It was a lot of just pushing, a lot of shoving. But it gradually got worse to the point where he began choking me and my older son, slamming me against the wall. And by the point of, I would say it was 2017, I realized that the only way that this was going to end is if I got away. Um, it wouldn't just be a divorce. I would have to get far, far away. So in 2017 until 2019, I really fought with him to beg him and plead that he would just give me the divorce. He was very well connected in Cleveland, our home state. His family members were very influential and in, in different people they had. So it was hard for me, even when I would file police reports or incident reports, nothing would happen. I finally was able to convince him. It was towards the end of 2018. I said, if you'll just let me get a divorce, I will give you everything. You won't have to have anything. I will allow you to keep the house that we purchase together. You won't have to provide any child support for the children, no medical, you know, nothing at all. I'll leave silently. And this was only after he was in financial ruins that I was able to use that as leverage to get away. We hadn't been having a relationship in about two years anyway. So the children and I had been sleeping together in a room and he slept in another part of the house. So, you know, I was able to kind of spin it in that way to get away. And so in March of 2019, I was granted the divorce. And in the in the dissolution of the divorce, I stipulated that in exchange for me giving him the home and waiving the $1,600 of child support that he would have been ordered to pay, in addition to the other $400 a month of medical, I would be able to take the children, full custody I would have, and I would relocate to Phoenix, Arizona with the children, and that the children would never have to return to Cleveland. There would be no conflict. There would be no issue. I would have full decision making, and I would be free. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. A few months after we left, he reached out. He said that he had made a mistake, that I had tricked him, that I had misled him, and that he demanded that I return with the children. And if I would not return, that I would begin sending him money monthly to supplement the difference in my income might not be in there. When I refused to do that, that's really when the post-separation abuse really kicked up. He began to utilize anything he could. He went to the court in Ohio and accused me of kidnapping the children. I had to respond to it. They pulled the docket. They saw that his signature was on it. We had a court hearing and everything and that I had permission to leave. As soon as that didn't go anywhere, he refiled with the court and said that he didn't know where the children were. And thus I was alienating the children, parental alienation. Again, they pulled the docket in Cleveland and they it showed that I had updated my address and I had done my due diligence. That didn't go anywhere. He filed once again in Cleveland. This time he was accusing me of not wanting to co-parent with him because I had purchased a phone for the children so he could reach out to them directly. Because when he would call on my phone, he was aggressive and, and just verbally belittling, accusing me of, of um, being intimate with a multitude of men and of exposing the children to different men and just really, really aggressive. So I purchased a phone for him to call the children himself. And that really upset him because I cut off contact with him. And so he demanded that we have mediation. Well, I was ordered to do mediation with him virtually, but when the docket was pulled up in the case history and it showed that there had been domestic violence, then that was not ordered anymore. It was pretty much squashed. He realized he lost control. And then at that point, he realized he had to come to Arizona. And in 2021, he relocated here, having already got a lawyer. He sold the house. So he had some liquid assets. And he was able to hire a very aggressive attorney. I was not because I was um, providing for five children alone, trying to get a home built for us here, trying to restart. And so he had an unfair advantage, if you will. And in doing so, he was able to really push the parental alienation agenda and saying that the reason that the children did not want to have a relationship with him was not because they witnessed him beating me and their eldest brother was because I had somehow coerced them not to want to be with him or not want to have a relationship. 
In the midst of all of this, he had began calling my phone again, had made threats to come here and kill me. And that was recorded and there was a witness. I was able to get an order of protection. So what's bizarre is that even when he came here, we had a court hearing in May of 2021. There was an active order of protection against him for me and my eldest son were included on that. And despite there being that, I was ordered to co-parent with him with week on week off visitation, children he had never seen. And he was very careful to maintain that caveat of our original agreement that he did not have to ever provide any support for the children. The judge said he honored that because I had shown that I had the wherewithal and the ability to provide for the children. So I was ordered to continue to provide for them solely. But we have joint custody, joint decision making. We call visitation, though he didn't have a home or at the time, and he still doesn't have a job. And so that was really the beginning of our nightmare. Within months, he began to abuse the children. One of the children had a stress induced seizure, 16 minute seizure, and was transported by ambulance from school to the hospital. He was there for two days, had an MRI, EKG. It was shown he does not have epilepsy. But what was shown was that there was an old brain bleed, which was very, very bizarre because there had been an incident years before where his father had hit his head against his brothers. And after that, the father didn't come to see him in the hospital. But that was really the beginning of it all. DCS was contacted and they really pushed the parental alienation. They kept going back with that. And ultimately, it was not until... March of last year, where DCS was contacted by a multitude of people following the father having poisoned the children, uh, having been found to have been choking them, withholding food from them, waterboarding one of them, which is holding their head underwater, repeatedly let them up and then putting his head back under the water. In addition to a lot of mental and uh, psychological abuse as well, DCS stepped in. And once again, in the family court system, they said, no, this is not happening. It is mother who is coaching these children to say these things about the father. Despite physical evidence of the abuse, mother is coaching the bruises on the children. She's coaching the breakouts around their mouth on the children. This is all mother's doing. And she's just trying to keep father from having a healthy relationship with his kids. So ultimately, this year, I was ordered to pay all of his legal fees, over $100,000. He was given final decision making, despite the fact that he had not allowed the children to get counseling. He was given everything and I was labeled an alienator. And this has been ongoing until June of this year, the end of June of this year, where my children were taken by force. So I have not had my children in my home since June 27th of this year. And it's been, every day has been a nightmare. Oh my goodness. That's just, that's just hard to imagine that, that the court system with you having an order of protection and having, you know, evidence of abuse that they would make those decisions. I mean, that's just crazy. Yeah. You say that your children who are all boys, that they were previously diagnosed with PTSD, but barred from treatment due to their father maintaining joint and now final decision making. Did you want to share any more about how they were treated? Were they all, all four abused by, by him? Absolutely. All four of them have been abused. There's one in particular who he is very, very aggressive towards. He's the most vocal of the four, definitely the most boisterous. And so he definitely is more aggressive to him more than the others. But all four of them have been abused by him. Following the initial um, DCS investigation, the boys were given um, psych evals and it was determined that they had PTSD based on abuse. When father heard of this, he immediately went to the appellate court because the judge we had in that case had ordered that the kids could get counseling based on father saying that he didn't have an issue with counseling. He just didn't want me to pick the counselor. And so at that point, the judge said, you know what, if this is the issue, well, then let's go ahead and do a blind list where mother submits some suggestions and father submits some suggestions. We both agreed to that. So I submitted my suggestions, having done my due diligence to ensure that all of them were viable. And the same that was not true of him. And ultimately, the judge selected two. The first one was one of father's suggestions. And the second one ended up being one of my suggestions. So I called the first one, which was father's. And I learned that it was actually an inpatient drug and alcohol treatment facility. They did not take anybody under 17 years old. So I was then able to call the secondary option, which was one of the ones that I had selected. And they were able to get the children in right away. And that's how the boys were diagnosed with PTSD and the baby with an adjustment disorder. And at that point, when father heard about that, he immediately halted service and then he took the judge to the appellate court, accusing the judge of violating his rights. His lawyer cited some case in which the judge had overstepped and had ordered it. But the difference was the judge did not order counseling. The 
judge has said, if this is an issue, the barrier to children getting counseling is just that we can't find a provider. He offered to select, you know, based on a blind list. Well, the appellate court ultimately ruled in favor of the judge and said that the judge did not overstep his bounds. And he said, and they, you know, kicked it back to the family court. At that point, father said, well, you know what? Then I just changed my mind. I do not agree to allow the children to receive services. So the boys were never treated for the PTSD that they were diagnosed with. Wow. It sounds like, you know, he, he was given a lot of power somehow in this court system. Do you think that him refusing to allow them to go to therapy would go in your favor, but it doesn't sound like it did. No, it's so crazy because even after that, this is the same judge who he took to the appellate court was the one who ultimately made the decision that a father should have final decision making, that I should pay all of father's legal fees. And ultimately, knowing that father made that decision, he ultimately empowered him and said, well, you know, you're an alienator. You're an alienator. Same judge. Well, I'm so sorry. And he signed that document in the beginning. So none of it really makes any sense. No. So custody was given to your ex-husband without your notification, and you were not allowed to even hug your children goodbye on that day. How did this come to happen? It was a shock. So this final ruling that came in, giving father final decision making, ordering us to go back to week on week on visitation and ordering me to pay all of his legal fees. It actually came out in May of this year. The hearing was in March, but the judge, as soon as the hearing took place, he rotated out. So there was a delay in the ruling being issued. So we got the ruling in the middle of May and like on a Monday or Tuesday. And it was ordered that on Friday of the same week that the children would be given to father for first visitation in about 14 months following the DCS investigation. Uh, it's also important to note that with the DCS investigation, the DCS worker who was involved in it, who did the investigations, she wanted to substantiate the abuse. She felt it happened and she had been trained in coaching. She went to court in March and testified that these children were not coached based on her training and her level of expertise and years of experience. Her exact words verbatim were, these children are not coached. I do believe this abuse took place. My intention was to substantiate this abuse. I put it up for substantiation and ultimately my supervisor did not sign off on it, citing that there needed to be more physical evidence. So even the DCS worker doing a very extensive investigation, she believed the children and believed the abuse took place. Likewise, there was a best interest attorney who was assigned to the case and she too advocated for the children, stating that they were well adjusted at home. There was no safety concerns here, that the children had been vocal themselves about not wanting to go with father and being fearful of him and that they had stated, this is very important, that if they were ordered to go with father, that they would not get out of the car. They told the best interest attorney that specifically, if we are ordered to go with him, we're not going to go. We're not going to get out the car. So this is important because in May, when the initial visitation was to occur, the boys refused to get out of the car. I I did everything I could to try to comfort them and tell them it's going to be okay. It's just going to be for a week. You'll be back home. They said, no, we're not getting out. We're not going with him. We're tired of being hurt. Ultimately, the police were called. The officers came out and the boys relayed the same to the officer. We're afraid. And they were very specific with the abuse that had taken place. None of their stories ever changed. They never added more to the abuse. They never took anything from it. They gave accounts explicitly exactly what happened. The the story never changed. So when the officers um, relate to the father, listen, the boys are saying that they don't want to go. And they're saying that you, you know, committed this abuse towards them. Father said, and it is documented in a police report, tell her to take the children home. I am giving permission for her to violate the court order right now. She could just take the children and go. Father does this whenever the police are called because he's fearful, I believe that um, he might be arrested. So when the police come, he immediately gives up and says, you know what? No, I don't want the kids. Never mind. And that's exactly what happened. Well, despite that, directly thereafter, he and his lawyer filed a motion in the court and said that I did not show up, that I did not show up to exchange the children. I was not cooperative in that exchange. And at this point, I had no lawyer. I, I was completely like depleted of all funds and I didn't have a lawyer. So I was trying to respond, but I was not able The following visitation that was to occur, father did not show up. And I documented that by messaging him on the Our Family Wizard app, telling him, you know, we are here. Where are you at? The children and I are waiting. It's getting hot. Waited a while. Kids are hungry. Are you going to show up? He responded about two hours later and stated, oh, yeah, I didn't show up. I I thought you might not come, so I didn't come. Well, once again, 
He and his lawyer motioned the court and said mother did not show up. Despite this, the following day, which was a Saturday morning, I had told him, I said, listen, you know, you didn't show up on Friday. I'm willing to try the exchange again. I'll come to the same, you know, designated location with the children and we can try again and see if you can maybe try to exercise your parenting time. He showed up. But as soon as we got there, um, he had an opportunity to speak with the children. The children began saying to him, we don't want to go with you. You know what you've done to us. You hurt us. You abused us. I have a video of him closing the door and saying, have a good day. Goodbye. And he left. And then we left. He again filed something with the court. So I say this only to say he did this these three times within the two visitations that were to occur. And in doing so, the judge issued an order that the following exchange should be facilitated by And they gave a name specific, a specific visitation supervisor who had been found to be unethical and had been um, misreporting in our case. And I already provided evidence of it. They wanted her to be the person who exchanged the children. And I was ordered to pay for it, despite the fact that and I could not be present. It's important. I was not to be present. So I paid for it. I, I complied. I didn't want any trouble. I had someone else go and take the children. I stayed home. And again, that visitation was unsuccessful. The children refused to go. And there was actually a passerby, someone who was a local legislator. She observed what happened and she spoke to the visitation supervisor who was acting as a transport agent and said, these children are scared and they're crying. What are you doing? When she asked her that, the woman gave up and said, well, you know what? Usually I leave in 15 minutes. We've been here for an hour. I'm just going to go ahead and let the kids go home. Well, the children did come home that day. But in doing so, that visitation supervisor, who was a transport agent, also sent a motion to the court stating that I had sent someone up there to bully her and that they prevented her from doing what she was supposed to do. And that after that, that is when I suppose, and I learned on the 27th, only on on, on the 27th, that a ruling was issued stating that it was an emergency warrant that he could take my children. I had no idea. So my boys were eating dinner on the 27th of June and unbeknownst to me, you know, I thought everything was normal. It was a regular day. Later on that week, I had every intention of trying to facilitate his exchange again. And I got a call from the police telling me to come home. I came home and they they showed me a warrant and the warrant is cited that I had just fled, that I had fled the state, that the father of my children had been looking for the children. He had just found us that I was in the process of fleeing again and that I'm a danger to my children. Therefore, the court is issuing a warrant for my children to be taken and given immediately to their father. And it was the boys fought. They cried. They screamed. They expressed the fact that they were fearful. They told it was five officers. We don't want to go. Please don't make us go. We're afraid of him. They told everything that he had done to them. The officers, you know, their, their hands were tied. They had to take them. Ultimately, within you know two hours after the boys continued to say they were not going to go, they began to say, you know what, if this is what it's got to be, we just, we'll just kill ourselves. We'd rather die. We'd rather die than to go with this man who's hurting us. We'd rather die quickly than to, than to you know, be killed slowly. And when that was said, they called an ambulance. And so two ambulances transported my children, two in each of them, to the hospital. I followed behind thinking that I was going to be able to be there and support my children. But once I got there, I was served a temporary order terminating all my parental rights and told that I had to vacate the premises. I was being violated saying that I was trespassing and I was not able to even hug my children goodbye. And that was it. That's that's so crazy. I mean, with all that, it's like any evidence you have is not even considered. Like it's because they can use the word alienation and or parental alienation, and that's kind of sounds like that's what the focus ended up being. Yes. Can you share the chance you thought you were given on June thirtieth to prove your innocence and what happened on that day? Yes, absolutely. So in the warrant, it stated that two things. It stated that the boys were to be brought before the judge on the thirtieth as well as I would have an opportunity to present my evidence. This, I had all the evidence in place, the orders from Ohio showing that I was able to bring them here, proof that I had been here for four years consecutively. I've never even left for vacation and that there was no fear or no threat of me leaving the state. I have no intention. I just recently purchased a home here, you know, had it built for my, for my children. So there's no, you know, nothing like that. So I was relatively certain that this was going to be rectified on the 30th. Once my children had the opportunity to speak to the judge, which has been their desire on going throughout this entire two years that we've been going through this. Can we speak to the judge? Can we express ourselves? My children are very vocal and they've been unable to do so. So I said, okay, you know, between the the boys speaking to the judge and expressing to her exactly what's going on and me presenting the evidence that would discount all that was alleged, I'm going to leave on the 30th with my children. So I went to court believing that. 
And when I got to court, I was completely maligned. I was railroaded. I got there and the attorney for my ex-husband went downstairs. She saw me. She went downstairs. She came back up with four armed security guards and she had them in court. She went directly into the courtroom and had ex parte communication prior to the hearing with the judge. When we got into court, it was a lot of things happening that were inappropriate. The judge had already made her decision. I presented my evidence and I was able to show that everything on the warrant was untrue, but I was told at that point that, well, these things may be untrue, but you're still a danger. And so when I asked, again, I don't have a lawyer. I said, well, how am I a danger? I work with children my entire life. I've never done anything to put any child in danger. Why am I a danger to my children? I was told because I had been speaking out and been vocal about the injustice with the family court system. And in doing so, I am a danger. And to be clear, I am not a danger to my children. I am a danger to the family court system. Therefore, I should not have my children. So I was, in essence, my children were taken from me. Not not because there's any allegation or any valid allegation of me ever having inflicted any harm upon them in any capacity, mental, spiritual, physical, psychological, emotional, nothing. It's because I spoke out and I had receipts to prove all that I stated was in fact the case. At one point in the case, in the hearing, the lawyer of my ex-husband began to cry. She uh, made a proclamation that he's the most gentle man she's ever known, far more gentle than her husband. And then she alleged that there were medical documents that she seen that she had laid eyes upon, but did not bring to court because they were so gruesome. And in these medical documents, I had committed some act of violence towards my children, but they were so gruesome that she could not bring them to have them added into evidence. And finally, she stated that myself and my current husband, who has been providing for my children for the last four years, that he assaulted her paralegal the day before and requested an order of protection. So in doing so, she eliminated all contact that I could have with my children and alleged that I was also a threat to her safety and to that of my ex-husband who is well known has brutally beat me and my children. Ultimately, in addition to that, I was not only not giving my children back and my children were not given the opportunity. They were not brought to court. The day before this hearing took place, his lawyer sent a, a email stating, can the children not come to court? I immediately responded and said, please, it is imperative that the children go to court. I had been made aware of the fact that the children actually were in the psych ward. At least one of them had been diagnosed with suicidal ideations and that they were in distress. And I wanted the judge and myself to lay eyes upon my children. Even after I stated that via email, they emailed back and said, no, the children will not be permitted to come to court. And I was ultimately ordered to have two hours of supervised visitation with the same visitation supervisor. I requested an option to have somebody else. They said, no, I could not have anyone else. The judge said it, then said it could be four hours, but she did not put that minute entry in until August the 1st. So I've only seen my children one time since then. Wow, that's just crazy. My mind is just like in disbelief at this point. Yeah. I don't even know how to feel. Like it's so yeah. horrible. And it's none of it makes any sense. I know. Like it's all. Especially when crazy. you have proof. The legal system, when you have proof, is supposed to override everything. And what about believing somebody's story? Yeah. You know, they, they're saying what's happening and yet they're, oh, they, somebody's opinion is that they're being coached. But what about their voice and what they're saying and their pleas for help? Yeah. These children's help to save their lives and keep them safe. I mean, this is just, wow, it's just a lot. It's a lot to take. Yeah. And I'm you said, so in, sorry. You said in your case too, do you think it was that they labeled you dangerous because you named names or just because they were trying to make you look like the abuser? Is it a combination of that? I think it's a combination of the two. I think that they really have attacked my character and they've maligned me in such a way because they want me to, to look as if I am unstable. And so that way they're able to take the stance of, oh, we're protecting the children from this live wire of a mother. But what has been harmful or, you know, to them, I would say is that they've not been able to substantiate any of that. It's one thing to, to make accusations and say, oh, the court is doing this or doing that. But because of the line of work that I'm in, I keep very good documents. I, I keep records of, of things very, very well for many years years. So I think why I've been labeled as being dangerous was because it's not just me saying things. It's not, you know, my word against theirs. It's their word against theirs. 
I'm able to present in documents that show, no, you said this and this is what happened. And it's not me saying this is what happened. Here's proof that this happened and yeah. this was not supposed to happen. And so that's where it becomes problematic is that they've not been able to really malign me in the way that they want to, to make it seem as if I have some type of vendetta or I'm some type of a bitter woman is genuinely that I'm trying to protect my children and that I'm willing to speak out and I'm willing to blow the whistle and I'll expose myself if it means saving my children and other people's. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're, you're doing what you can do by keeping track of what's, you know, like what they're doing, like you're saying, so you can prove to them, no, this is not what's happening, but yet they're not, they're seeing that as you being dangerous, which doesn't make any sense. Yeah. When we did the podcast with Lundy Bancroft, he talks about the corruption in the court mm -hmm. systems and we were on a side note and I said, I had felt so guilty for staying with him, but I knew that if I left him, that we were going to be in the courts battling and he would have made up lies about me and probably would have ended up with full custody of the kids. So I always stayed. I stayed until it got so bad that I couldn't. And my youngest was 16. So I only had to deal with it for two years. But that's why people don't understand why women stay and women, you know, when women go, like we shouldn't be punished for leaving an abusive. We're not, we shouldn't be being abused and neither should our children. Right. So something needs to change here. And I'm really thankful for what starting yeah. with this movement. Yeah, to get it out there. Yeah. It, it needs to yeah. be exposed to that. There can be some yeah, it's very, it's very, very sad. And unfortunately, it's not just Rachel's case. Yeah. It's so many. It's a pandemic in its own. And it's not just Arizona. It's like a pretty much every state uh, in the United States have this problem. Some states more than others. So, for example, here in Arizona, is is very sad. Like all the parents that we have right now, the cases are are just like this. Very heartbreaking to hear. And most of the people outside, like when you have not going through this, they just don't believe that this actually is happening. That how come the judges are doing this? Yeah. And within reality, I mean, the children are taken as a piece of property, not even considered like a human being. Yeah. And especially in the cases of abuse. So, for example, right now, the statistics in the United States indicate that in all the family court cases that have abuse of some type in the case, 96% of those cases, the custody goes to the abuser. And only 4% of the cases the children are protected and are with a protected parent. Wow. That's uh, crazy. The statistics are just like that. And Did you say 96% uh, go to the abuser? Yes, 96% goes to the abuser and only 4% the kids are protected. Do you think that's why, um, I mean, do you think it's because, because I know when we were talking to Lundy Bancroft, he was saying that there's, you know, a lot of men's, there's a men's movement that a lot of the abusers get in. And do you think it has to do with that, that they're just... Well, it has to do with not just that. It comes from the immunity that the judges and all the justice system have. And it's an immunity where you cannot do anything to the judges and the judges give immunity to anybody involved in it. So yes. that's really bad. And it's a, it's a corruption it itself. Like a, everybody can do whatever they want mm -hmm. without anybody being accountable of yeah. the decisions and they do. And and lately, I have noticed that in the past two years, it's getting worse. They are not even following the, for example, here in Arizona, they are not following the court rules. So, I mean, they go on the fly and, and on the fly, they are doing whatever they want as an order. And if, for example, in the case of Rachel, as, as she was explaining, it doesn't make any sense. She has all the evidence. She has even court orders coming from Ohio. She has every possible thing like you can think that. I mean, she can protect her, her, yeah. her sons, right. but it's not, it's not about the kids. It's about how they can profit from the yeah. case. It's yeah. about like wow. a whole, it's a huge abuse of power. Yeah. Uh, what they are doing. And, uh, and as I'm saying, like, they don't care about our kids. They don't care about them. They just care about money, how they can profit out of us. And only that, like, if you see the whole system as a, overall, all of it is not working. So the family court is not working. The juvenile court is not working at the same time. And also the criminal is not working because even when you have a substantiated report from DCS, you have parents that are abusers and they have been even arrested. When they go to the criminal case in downtown Phoenix, the prosecutors don't prosecute them. So for example, in my case, 
detective arrested my ex-husband against the abuse that he did in my kids. So she thought, well, we have enough evidence to, to probably prosecute him. So, but then he was arrested only for two to 48 hours and he was released. And when I got to talk with the prosecutor after a lot of me trying, because she did not want to talk with me, she told me that there was not enough evidence because either he confessed or we have physical evidence of what happened. So when I talk back with my detective in my case, she told me that that's very common that in her 20 years working in abuse cases of children, she was only able to arrest 10% of those cases. And from that 10%, she sent to the prosecutor's office, only 10%, the prosecutor was to prosecute, which means that only 1% of the population of abusers are like a, some, some kind of punishment, but 99% are free in the street and nobody does anything, nothing. Mm. So, I so mean, 99% are free. Yes. 99% are free. And when you are in position as a mom, as a protective mom, I mean, what do you do? Nothing right. other than try to expose the abuse, how organize your evidence, try to present everything as much as you can and as best as you can. But the family court system, for example, what they do the best is just accuse you that you are alienating the kids. I mean, and that's like a, the standard of all the cases that you are accused of alienation. As, as soon as you say there was mm -hmm. abuse, they accuse you, oh, you are Therefore, you're a bad parent, for you should not have the kids. And then you get punished with fines. And for example, as Rachel was saying, she ended up paying like all the attorney's fees. She's being put in the stand like she is the worst person in the world. And unfortunately, that's the norm. That's the norm. Wow. Very much the norm. When you think with a, you know, when an adult, like when I got my order protection, they usually veer on the side of caution and they give it to you. Well, why won't they listen to a child and veer on the side of caution and look out for that child's best interest? Right. That's what extremely disturbing sense. to me that we don't care about the child's safety by their testimony, by their voice. These kids should be able to have a voice and yeah. we should believe them just to keep them safe. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. It's and it's true. But remember that here in the United States of America, the standard of justice is you are innocent until proved guilty. And that standard goes across everything else. So if you go in another, for example, in any country in Latin America, the standard is the opposite. You are guilty until proved innocent. And actually in Latin America, the children testify and the judges believe them. And here you can try. I mean, Rachel has tried for the kids to even come to court and the kids' voice to be heard by somebody. And they refuse all the time that the kids should not have any boys. And uh, that's one of some of the things that we actually want to implement somehow that and remove the immunity of, of the judges. Yeah. Uh, that's something that we are working towards because none of this is okay. Like yeah. this is, yeah. this is poor evil and it shouldn't yeah. be like that. And judges shouldn't have, I mean, there should be accountability in any kind of system like that. Like you could get someone that's, I mean, I know Lindy Bancroft was talking about that. Like if you have a judge that tends to have more of a narcissistic personality, he is going to rule more in the favor of an abuser because, you know, he's coming from that perspective. So there should be in any system like that, somebody that has that much power, you know, to, to make those decisions, to have somebody that has some accountability on the yeah. judge's character and all that type of thing. It's just interesting that we're doing this podcast today and I'm like right in the middle of a child abuse case and he's 12 and he's, he called DCS with the parent and said, I'm being abused. And, and, and they haven't even, it's been over a week, week and a half, maybe 10 days. They haven't even responded. It's the point where I had to call and, and now he has to go back with the other parent that's abusing because he just didn't do anything about it. And so this is just breaking my heart right now. Cause he, mm -hmm. you know, 12 is, is old enough to be able to listen to that child. Yeah. And, and try to keep that child safe, but it's not happening. So I, now that you're saying this, I'm like, well, this is happening right now and someone I'm trying to help. Mm -hmm. So 
Rachel, your motion for an emergency meeting was denied in spite of evidence that showed your children were suffering. You have a false order of protection against you. Can you share how you have tried to speak up and the outcome? Yes, absolutely. To be continued. Stay tuned for next week's part two. You don't want to miss it. Thanks for tuning in to Hanging On To Hope. Check out our website, hangingontohope.org. There are resources on there. And if you would like to donate or volunteer, you can do that through our website. We are a brand new nonprofit, so we appreciate any and all support. And we thank you for listening. And until next time, keep hanging on to hope. We are evidence that there is hope and healing for you. And our passion is to help you find it too. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening, everyone.